I can guarantee all of you have been infected with, are currently infected with, and will be infected with some type of virus in your life. They are everywhere. They're on the chairs you're sitting on, they're on the clothes you're wearing, they're on the food we eat, the water we drink, they're on our skin, and they're inside our bodies. Some viruses come and go, like the common cold. Others we have vaccines for, like polio, measles, and hepatitis. And then there are those that cause absolute panic and pandemonium around the world, like SARS, Zika, Ebola, and the one I will be talking about today, HIV. The problem with the HIV epidemic is we haven't found a way to stop it yet. Despite all our best efforts, there still is no cure or vaccine. We can't convince everyone to use a condom every time they have sex, nor to use clean needles to inject drugs. There's also immense political opposition to needle exchange programs, widespread resistance to condom distribution efforts, and a lack of legal protections for key populations like sex workers and men who have sex with men. So the scientific community came up with a solution, a temporary one, if I may say. We just have to reduce the amount of virus in each infected person so it is less likely that one infected person will transmit it to another. And the good news is, we have a way to do this. By taking a cocktail of drugs called antiretroviral therapy, or ART, those with HIV can reach a clinically undetectable status, become virtually uninfectious, and lead normal, healthy lives. ART has had a profound impact on the epidemic, and HIV is no longer the death sentence it once was in the 80s. However, ART is not a panacea, and the real challenge is the medication is for life, every single day for the rest of your life. If you stop treatment, and as soon as you stop treatment, your viral load goes back up, you become infectious again, and you could even develop resistance to the drugs. So here is where my research comes in the picture. I research the barriers and facilitators to retention in HIV care that patients face at the healthcare system level in Kenya. This past summer, I had the opportunity to investigate this topic further, working with a team of public health researchers, doctors, and outreach workers in Western Kenya. I saw for myself the many factors that influence patient engagement, like food insecurity, stigma, economic deprivation, and system-level factors like long lines at the hospitals and unstructured waiting rooms that compromise patient privacy. I'm currently in the process of analyzing two qualitative data sets from the perspectives of Kenyan patients and clinicians. What is really surprising are the parallels that are emerging between the challenges to patient engagement experienced by people in Kenya and those who are frequently cited by patients here in the US. My hope is that this data will afford us a broader understanding of patient engagement and spur policy reform that would improve the quality, access, and delivery of care in Kenya and perhaps even in other countries. So why is this important? You could argue having a healthier population is good for economic growth. You could say treating people now will save us money in the future. But the way I see it, this is much more fundamental than any economic or mercenary issue. I believe health is a human right, therefore this is about human rights. In an increasingly globalized world, the life and health of people living anywhere in the world is our health. We have the treatments available and we know they work. We have to find a way to enable people who need them the most to be able to access them. And with that, I would like to leave you with a quote by Paul Farmer to reflect on. If access to healthcare is considered a human right, who is considered human enough to have that right? Thank you.